The attributes of God are distorted by human beings. Often believers talk more of the love of God than other attributes of God. Unbelievers that have any sense of God talk even more of the love of God. Such talks have tended to overemphasize the love of God over and above other attributes of God. The talks tended to be in the erroneous sense that God loves so much that he would not punish sin. They thus distort or confound the love of God with the justice of God. They claim that he will either not care so much about sin or he will forgive all. But no matter how man may try to have his own way, the word of God does not change. The sincere seekers look unto Holy Scripture for guidance. Yes, looking into Holy Scripture, sincere seekers will discover that there is much more to God than just love. The believers who understand their God and their faith, we also know that the attributes of God work together in harmony and that true believers will not distort the attributes of God in an attempt to have their own way. Man emphasizes any of the attributes of God over others at his own peril. So today, we want to have a look at one aspect of God that though is frequently taught in scripture, the people tended to either ignore or explain away. And that is the inclination of human beings for vengeance. It is important for us to recognize this. Human beings have inherent inclination to break laws. The inclination is always there for human beings to, to take the laws into their own hands. Breaking the law seems inherent in humans, believers in Christ included. Don't let that surprise you because if you look around you, you will see how quite a large number of believers behave like unbelievers. This is especially noticeable in wrongdoing against a person. Human beings want to immediately right the wrong by immediate retaliation. A retaliation often informed by their own self-righteousness that is calculated to hurt maximally. It's important also to realize that human beings have a penchant for vengeance. Immediate retaliation may not be possible, or it may not achieve the degree of damage they desire for the offender. In such situations, the aggrieved person may bid his time by planning the appropriate retaliation. Revenge is an instinct in man. You hear statements like, it is payback time. I'm going to get you. Watch your back. You will pay for this. The vengeance is then planned to have a serious impact of the will be on the will be victim. The vengeance seeker will usually have many reasons to justify the act of retaliation. Somehow, many believers while carrying out acts of vengeance conveniently ignore the word of God as they focus on their own feelings, injury, pain, or hurt. Attempts to pacify this angry person bent on vengeance will usually meet with resistance. And resentment. Much venom is hissed out with statements like, You don't know what terrible things this person has done. If you are the one, you will act worse than me. You cannot understand how much this person has hurt me. God knows this person deserves the most terrible punishment. I will never forgive you. 
I will make sure you pay for this. And such like statements are said in anger. And truly, such statements are spoken with anger and venom. It's also important for us to recognize the fact that wickedness is not good. Wickedness is never acceptable amongst human beings, not to even now speak of the Holy God. It is not right to be wicked to anyone. No human being should purposefully hurt another human being. The Lord always knows the whole truth about every situation and event. And God never minimizes our hurt and pain. He is also against wickedness and evil. And because of all this, the Lord has a preferred response to wickedness. Don't let that surprise you. Our God who pretends every activity of his creation. In every situation, he has a preference. So, however, like many things in the life of his people, we need to understand this also. The Lord has a preference, a preferred response to wicked acts of human beings. This preferred option is what the Lord commands his people. And like all his commands, the command of the Lord concerning vengeance or retaliation is to be obeyed in all situations. It is possible that many believers in Christ take to retaliatory activities out of lack of understanding of the seriousness with which God views the issue of vengeance. Whether the passive offender is a believer in Christ or an unbeliever, believers are warned not to put forth their hand to do evil. Some may demand to know why they cannot or should not avenge themselves. What God says about anything takes precedence over human opinion. And so to Holy Scripture, we turn for our education. Hence, the title of this video is How You Are to Respond to the Wickedness Done to You. You see that ferocious-looking animal, as if ready to devour its victim. This is akin to how some people react when some wrong has been done to them. And so, it is important for us to know how you and me are to respond to wickedness done to you or to us. Remember, it is never right to disobey clearly stated commands of the Lord. The word of God to guide us is as in Deuteronomy chapter 32 verses 34 to 43. And I read, Is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures? To me belong a vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time. For the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. For the Lord shall judge his people, and repent himself for his servants, when he see it that their power is gone, and there is none shut up or left. And he shall say, Where are their gods? They are rock in whom they trusted, which did eat the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offerings. Let them rise up and help you and be your protection. See now that I, even I, am he 
and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. For I lift up my hand to heaven, and I say I live forever. If I wet my glittering sword, and my hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to my enemies, and will reward them that hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with blood, and my sword shall devour flesh, and that with the blood of the slain and of the captive, from the beginning of revenges upon the enemy. Rejoice, O ye nations, which is people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants, and will render vengeance to his adversaries, and will be merciful unto his land and to his people. May the Lord bless his words in our hearts in Jesus' name. The prelude to this story is that the book of Deuteronomy was the last address of Moses to Israel before his departure. The Israelites were in the plains of Moab across the Jordan, in the plain opposite the Red Sea, between Paran and Tophel, according to Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 1. They were at the verge of entering Canaan, the land God had promised them through their patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Deuteronomy 32 verses 1 to 47 is the song of Moses. It was the song the Lord gave Moses to give to his people Israel, according to Deuteronomy 31 verse 19. This was his final exhortation to them and to warn Israel against becoming disloyal to the Lord and his commandments given to them. This song sets forth the mercy and the vengeance of the Lord. Our text, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 34 to 43, is a section that speaks of the compassion and vengeance of the Lord. And so we turn now to look a bit closer at the text we have just read. Is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures? The wicked acts of the enemies of Israel were known to the Lord. They are stored up in his store, that is, house of treasures. Also the plans of God are already made, and his purpose determined and kept secret to the time of their implementation. The time of the judgment and how it is going to be carried out is known only to God. Hence, is letting us know, is asking that rhetorical car question of, is it not laid up? The answer is yes, they are laid up. The answer is that God knows everything the wicked have done. God knows also his plan as to how to deal with the situation. At the right time, the judgment shall take place. The same image is alluded to elsewhere in the epistle to the Romans, chapter 2, verses 4 to 5. Or despise thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. For after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself, wrought against the sea, the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. 
So he's speaking about the same thing of the activities of the wicked that are known to God and are stored. In other words, God has a determined time for his wrath, his judgment, to fall upon the ungodly. So it is important for us to understand that we are being warned that though it may seem to us that God is slow in doing something about wickedness, that in fact, he does not reckon time as we do, and he does not overlook the wickedness of man. Hence, we are told, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us word, not willing that any to perish, but all that all should come. To repentance, 2 Peter 3.29. Verse 35 tells us, To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their food shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. So this is letting us understand that vengeance and recompense, that is retribution, belong to God. Vengeance is punishment inflicted in retaliation for an injury or offense. Revenge is repaying harm with harm. They av to avenge usually by retaliating in kind or degree. Often when it is man, the person who is Carrying out the revenge aims to do maximum damage, much more beyond whatever is perceived to have been done wrong. So we need to understand that retribution or recompense is the dispensing or receiving of reward or punishment for something done. When it is God, vengeance does not suggest vindictive and arbitrary reprisals, for only humans are arbitrary in their ways and actions. Our God is always thoughtful. Our God is never irrational. Our God is never someone who is in haste and does the wrong thing. So rather, vengeance is retributive justice, which is the prerogative of the Lord as he alone determines the manner and the timing of the repayment for whatever has been done. Again, this principle is affirmed elsewhere in the New Testament. And so we are told, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, in like manner giving themselves over to fornication, and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. June 7. So we are told their food shall slide in due time. That is the food of the wicked. In this particular case, people who have been wicked to the people of God, they will not be found anymore. They will slip away from righteousness, away from peace, and away from the Lord, as judgment comes upon them. For the day of their calamity is at hand. That is, the day of judgment is the day of their calamity. And as determined by God that day is at hand, it will soon come when they least expect. And the things that shall come upon them, make haste. In other words, the different and varied disasters that we herald the judgment of God is coming as if in a hurry. It will come upon them when they least expected and when they, least pre when they are least prepared. Again, we know the Lord who has sworn by himself and as there is no one greater than him, to deal with his adversaries. 
And so it goes on further. For the Lord shall judge his people and repent himself for his servants when he seeth that their power is gone and there is none shut of. The Lord shall judge his people. He's telling us that he will judge for them. That is, vindicate them. He will judge his enemies. He will deal with them in the way they do not expect. God, who alone is completely just, is therefore the only one best place to judge and make right all the wrongs committed. Again, we are reminded in the word of God, There be beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. I hope you notice that it is the Lord who says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And so it is the prerogative of God. It is in the exclusive list of God, if I may say so, to judge the wicked, to take vengeance upon the ungodly. So it is very important for us to understand all this and repent himself for his servants. God will change his manner of conduct towards his people. Repent himself means the Lord showed compassion. It does not mean the, the Lord has sinned and has to repent like we do. No, it's just letting us know that when God sees the situation of his people, that God will show compassion. If you remember the story of Israelite in the uh, during the time of the judges, oftentimes they, they went into apostasy, they went into idolatry, and God punished them by allowing their enemies to rule over them. And each occasion that they cried unto the Lord, out of the agony, and they tried to manage to repent, God came to their aid by setting up leaders to deliver them. And so it's important for us that even in his, for us to understand that even in his anger to judge the wickedness of the enemies, God will have compassion upon his people. God is never so angry like human beings that he will lose control of himself. God is always in control. And so we see, we are told here that when he see it, that their power is gone. After God had used the ungodly nations to punish his people, the ungodly will go beyond what God has prescribed as punishment for his people. And we think whatever evil they visited upon the people of God was out of their own power. They will destroy the political power and religious practices of the people of God and completely subjugate them. The false God they had trusted would not have been able to help them. So there is none shut up or left. The victory of the adversaries over the people of God will be so complete and comprehensive that there will be no there will not be any strong or fortified city left untaken, and not even one family left without being carried into captivity or scattered into foreign lands. Remember, what was being said there was here was I initially in the future. They were at the verge of entering the promised land, and God was letting them understand what they were going to go through and how he was going to deal with them. So when God sees the powerlessness and suffering of his people in their defeat and the boasting of their adversaries, he will change his mind and will have mercy on them. This was exactly what happened repeatedly during the time of the judges. So God will then do justice to his people by avenging them of their enemies. Remember, this is a promise that the Lord will judge Israel as a nation. The nation is made up of both the righteous and the wicked. 
Thus, the law helps the righteous by destroying the wicked. The servants of the Lord are the righteous. All who in time of judgment are faithful to the Lord. Malachi 3.16 verses Malachi chapter 3 verses 4 to Malachi 3 verses 16 to chapter 4 verse 3. The Lord has judged Israel not to destroy the nation, but to punish the sinners and to show fully the folly of their false gods. And so that's what we see here in Deuteronomy 32, verses 37 to 38. Ultimately, the Lord will restore his people after their defeat and exile, according to Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 to 3. Again, remember, as at the time, this was speaking of the future that was going to take place in the life of the nation of Israel. And he shall say, where is their gods? They are rock in whom they trusted. So this is like sarcasm or mockery now. The false gods, they substituted for their true God. Yes, this is sarcasm, not an admission that the false gods are real. The false gods exist and are real only to those who imagine they exist and worship them, even the apostate Israel. There are many like that today also, who believe in false gods, who take the false gods to be something. And so God was saying, where are those false dog gods now in the time of your need, in the time of your distress? Why don't you now go to them? Because you have made them your rock. You have made them your savior. And of course, the answer to this, the question is, nowhere, for they were not gods, but dump idols. He said, they, they, they are rock in whom they trusted. In this case, their rock was the false gods they had gone after. Remember, Yahweh was their true god. And the true rock but they rejected him and in his place installed the various gods of canaan if amongst which was Baal, the fertility god god now will confront them and let them know that these gods were indeed not god thus they have not been able to prevent the true god from carrying out the judgment which he had repeatedly pronounced upon them through his prophets. So this is again mocking those false gods. You know, elsewhere in the, in the Bible, they are described as having head with no brain. They have eyes that they cannot see. They have hands, but they cannot hold anything. They have legs, but they cannot walk. They still have to be carried. And they have to be tied down somewhere so that they do not tip over. It goes on, which did eat the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offerings. Let them rise up and help you and be your protection. So we see here that out of the abundance God gave to his people, they were bringing these various sacrifices to these false gods. They seem not to realize that God, the true God, was the one who was giving them the abundance of these things that they were sacrificing to these false gods. So God was now challenging them. Let them rise up and help you and be your protection. So let your false gods help you and, your, uh, uh, and protect you. This is mockery of those who trusted in the false gods and the impotence and uselessness of the false gods. And so, in their time of need, it became apparent that truly these were false gods that could neither protect nor save anyone. 
go through a series of rhetorical questions calculated to awaken their conscience and, and turn their hearts towards, towards him and away from this false god, God challenges them to rethink their actions and circumstances. He mocks those who followed the false gods. He goes on, See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me. I kill, I make alive, I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. God now reaffirms what his people already knew, that he alone is the true and living God. And so he asks them to humble themselves and be convinced of his truth. For he had abundantly proved, to, proved so much in their lives. He is Yahweh, their God, and he alone can destroy, and he alone can save. Their idols can neither, neither destroy, help, or save them. And so God affirms again, there is no God like the Lord. Also called gods are false gods. God has no sibling, God has no companion, and God has no accomplice. He broods no competition. He is in a class by himself. He is like no other. He alone has no beginning. He lives forever. He created everything out of nothing. And he reigns sovereignly over all creation. He, say, he tells us here, I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. This might shock some people. Sometimes when they want to let God off the hook, if I may say, they say God does not do all, the, all these things. But the word of God makes us to understand God does these things. It, it is frequent that when something unpleasant happens to somebody, the first thing they think about is the devil. But nobody thinks about it that, of the possibility that perhaps they were undergoing, they are undergoing judgment. And that's what we're being told here, that God visits his people with judgment, not to destroy them, but to turn their heart back to him. He is a God of mercy, as he is the God of justice. Again, letting us understand, we are not to confound the attributes of God. God works in harmony. God is in harmony and in peace with himself. He does not overemphasize one of his attributes over another. He works in harmony and in unison with himself. He is a God of mercy. He's also the God of justice. Yes, he is a God that has compassion. He's also a severe God. Even though he loves, it's, it's just this demands that the wicked be punished. And so it's important for us to understand this. He's ready to save the repentant as he's ready to punish the rebellious. He says there, neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. It's important for us to understand this. Nobody can deliver anyone or anything out of the hand of the Lord. When David was in trouble and God was giving him options of what to do, what did David say? He said, it is better I fall into the hands of God because God will show mercy. It is important for us to recognize this. In fact, the Bible elsewhere makes us to understand who we should be afraid of. It is God that we should be afraid of. You see, if you have a problem with the devil, you call upon God and he, can deliver, he will deliver you. If it's with another human being or some other entity, God is the one who can deliver you. But when it is God, except God will have mercy. Except God, we have compassion. 
nobody that can deliver you from the hand of the living God. Nobody is equal to or greater than him. And therefore, none can or will successfully deliver from his hand or successfully oppose what God has determined to be done. So it is very important for you to understand this. So we see that first the first gods were shown to be worthless in verses 37 to 38 of our text. This declaration of the nature of the God of Israel was then presented in contrast to show that the God of Israel is the living God, is the only God who can not only offer help but protect Israel. The truth is that there is only one God, the living God of Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 4 to 5. And also 32 verse 16. He alone reigns sovereignly over all creation. The Lord has the power of life and death regarding Israel. And the power to wound and to heal them. That same also power is available to the New Testament believers. Remember, God alone controls the existence of human beings. And he is completely at liberty to do whatsoever he wants. This is also an affirmation of the incomparability of the Lord. Psalm 113, verses 4 to 6. So, this is why we are warned that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hebrews 10. Verse 31. It goes on. For I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. So, for I lift up my hand to heaven, God's lifting up of his hand was the gesture used in taking oath in those days. When you look at Genesis 14 verse 22 and Ezekiel 20 verse 5, for example, and say, I live forever. God alone lives forever. He is eternal. He has no beginning. He has no ending. So this is our note. A note is a solemn calling upon God to witness to the truth of what a person says or to witness that a person sincerely intends to do whatever he says, failing that that God should judge that person. The implication is that one swears by calling upon God to be a witness of the situation with the possible implication that he will judge the one who breaches whatever conditions had been agreed upon by the parties concerned. A true believer will therefore not take a note falsely, as I will be calling upon God to be a false witness. Usually, a person will swear by the name of someone higher than the parties involved in the matter that calls for that oath. In human affairs, a note will usually end or settle all disputes as God the judge has been called in as a witness. Hence, as if wanting to assure man, the law engages in a practice humans are well used to, oath taking. However, unlike man, there is no higher, there is no one higher than God. Hence, in taking a note, he can only do so in his own name. And so we see God here saying, I lift up my hand to heaven and I say I live forever. He goes further, if I wet my glittering sword and my hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to my enemies 
I will reward them that hate me. I will make my arrows drawn with blood, and my sword shall devour flesh, and that with the blood of the slain and of the captives, from the beginning of revenges upon the enemy. So we see here in these verses uh, 41 and 42, if God sharpens his flashing sword and decides to judge, he will render vengeance to all his enemies. So God continues in human language and describes what he was going to do. Another nation will be used by God to defeat the enemies of Israel. That nation will be God's instrument to carry out his vengeance. Therefore, God referred to that nation as his glittering sword, his arrow, and so on. God describes the impending judgment in figurative and graphic detail. As in human affairs, a note, take, a note settles the matter in any dispute. God here assures his people and theirs and his enemies in equal measure that assuredly he was going to carry out the judgment he promised through his prophet speaking to his people and their enemies over an extended period. To them, as prophet after prophet called them back for, from their idol worship back to God and proclaimed the impending judgment if they refused, it became commonplace to refer to these prophets of God as prophets of doom. It got to a level that they became so hardened that they thought God was not seeing what they were doing or what they were doing was pleasing to God. And his prophets were just alarmists why they followed their own false prophets. There are many today in the churches that mock the true children of God. They claim they are uh, uh, too, um, too strict, that God is not hard, uh, God understands. You don't have to be doing all that you are doing. You know, it didn't start in our day. It has always been like that. We are told in these verses how complete the judgment of God upon his enemies will be when he carried that judgment out. Again, you see there, if I wet my glittering sword and my hand take hold of judgment, I will render vengeance to my enemies and will reward them that hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with blood. That is God speaking. I lift up my hand. It's used here, you know, again, as a note-taking gesture to bring vengeance upon his enemies. The Lord can only swear by himself that there is no one greater than his eternal self. And we see that in Isaiah 45, verse 23. Also Jeremiah 22, verse 5, and Hebrews 6, 17. And so it will happen that the nations, as we are told, rejoice, O ye nations, with his people. For we have vain the blood of his servants, and we render vengeance to his adversaries, and we be merciful unto his, his land and to his people. God will always show compassion to his people. The nations are called upon to rejoice with the people of God. God will avenge the blood of his servants. He will render vengeance to his enemies. But the Lord will be merciful to his land and to his people. Remember, God knows how to separate the righteous from the wicked. So that the righteous will not be counted among the wicked. That is, the Lord will distinguish between his people and his enemies. 
His people will not suffer the same fate as the wicked. That should be a good reassurance to every child of God. It doesn't matter how bad the situation may be. It doesn't matter how terrible the judgment is going to be. At the day and the time, and by the manner God decides to carry out judgment, He knows how to separate his children from among the wicked. He will not punish his children with the wicked. So it's important for us to recognize this. What is being spoken about here is the vindication and vengeance of God. Yes, this passage, Deuteronomy 32 verses 34 to 43, speaks of the vindication and the vengeance of the Lord. First, as we are told, the false gods were shown to be worthless. Verses 37 to 38. This declaration of the nature of the God of Israel was then presented in contrast to show that the God of Israel is a true and living God. He is the only God who cannot only help or protect Israel. Remember, it is still the same God of the New Testament believers. God will recall the rebellious activities of his people. He will remind them of their evil activities, even while they claimed they were worshipping and serving him. While indeed, they were worshipping and serving false gods in their idolatrous religious practices. The same is happening today. There are many who attend services. There are many who congregate with the people of God. But actually, they are worshipping their own God, not the true and living God. The false gods are impotent and useless in every respect. So that's why we saw God mock the people and their false gods. Judges 10, 14, Jeremiah 2, 28. Go and cry unto the gods which ye have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. Judges 10 verse 14. But where are thy gods that thou hast made thee? Let them arise, if they can save thee in thy time of trouble. For according to the number of thy cities are thy gods, O Judah. Jeremiah 2.28 It is important for us to understand and accept, as God has said, vengeance belongs to God. God states this clearly. Remember again, we are talking about how you are to respond to the wickedness done to you. The enemy of God is the enemy of the people of God. The enemy of the people of God is the enemy of God. The law states clearly, to me be longer vengeance and recompense. Deuteronomy 32, 35. This is repeated severally in different ways in Holy Scripture. Wherefore, their way shall be unto them as slippery ways in the darkness. They shall be driven on and fall therein, for I will bring evil upon them, even the year of their visitation, seeth the Lord. Jeremiah 23, 12. Therefore saith the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, Ah, I will ease me of my adversaries, and avenge me of my enemies. That is Isaiah one twenty four. It goes on. The Lord took a note. I lift up my hand. Deuteronomy thirty two forty two forty two. This is the Lord. 
giving assurance as he takes an oath to bring vengeance on his enemies. He is telling his people to be rest assured that it doesn't matter how long the wicked stay, how much they are wicked, they will not go unpunished, that he will deal with them at his own time. And the Lord can only swear by himself, remember, as there is no one greater than his eternal self. So the Lord has sworn by himself, yes, that he would deal with his adversaries. Again, this should be enough assurance to, for the people of God and should settle the matter of who should take vengeance upon the wicked. Further, God saying, vengeance is mine, limits and consecrates retribution. Remember, our God is a holy God. He cannot do evil. Yes, he cannot do evil. There, please, that's Deuteronomy 32, verse 35. Not just Deuteronomy 35. So, when he carries out vengeance, it will be in his holiness, it will be in harmony with his character. He says clearly that vengeance belongs to him. He owns vengeance and no one else. He could not speak clearer than this. So, this is both a reassurance and a warning. To the people of the Lord. It is an assurance to the people of God that their enemies will be punished. It doesn't matter how long people claim God is delaying or is not looking, is not seeing or is not doing something. He's letting us know that that is not true. That he actually knows the wicked. He knows what they are doing and he knows when to punish them. It is a warning to the people of God that they must not carry out vengeance themselves. As the Bible puts it somewhere uh, elsewhere, the people of God should not put forth their hand to do evil. Remember, wickedness remains wickedness, irrespective of the person who does the evil act. The enemy of God, again, one can't repeat this enough, is the enemy of the people of God. The enemy of the people of God is also the enemy of God. So, God and his people are opposed to wickedness. Wickedness is opposed to God and his people. So, the people of God should not meddle in the thing God has reserved exclusively for himself. No person is to play God by doing what is God's premise, uh, uh, which is in God's premise to do. Hence, those who seek to avenge themselves will be interfering with the prerogative of God. And that will be a sin, a sin that God takes very, very seriously. The people of God should therefore not avenge themselves. <clears throat> the Lord created all, including his people and the enemies. God knows everything done by all his creatures. He has perfect knowledge of all his creation. Hence, a retribution inflicted by God himself or his agents instruments will always be a just retribution. 1 Peter 2.14 The vengeance by God will come at the time God has appointed and to the degree determined by him. And so it's important for us to look and to understand the wicked and their punishment. So the question may be asked, who are the wicked? 
it is important for us to understand that the wicked being spoken of here. Yes, in these passages of Holy Scripture are human beings. They are not spirits. The Lord is aware of the activities of the devil and his host of fallen angels and demons. He knows the enormous influence the world exerts on human beings. And the Lord knows that the various ways that the devil and the world influence human beings to do wicked and evil acts. That is, the Lord has complete knowledge of the activities of the kingdom of darkness. But make no mistake, the wicked being spoken of here are human beings. They are not angels, they are not demons. Yes, this is not the devil being spoken of here. And God is letting us know that God does not accept any excuse for wickedness in any human being. However, human beings who engage in wickedness and evil acts, including unbelief, however, they may give any excuse or any explanation. They are never excused based on, you know, things like, you know, hear somebody saying, the devil made me do it. God never accepts any excuse from any person for doing any wicked act. So it is important for us to recognize that everyone is responsible and accountable for his evil actions. So, so stop saying the devil made me do it. Stop giving an excuse that somebody made you angry. That's why you were angry. It might look reasonable to you or to your fellow human beings. For such reasons and excuses are never acceptable to God. It takes everybody to be responsible and accountable for their action. So, as we are told, the soul that sins, that soul is the one that will die. So, we see that nations and individuals, even that the, the Lord used as instruments of his judgment, against the wicked nations and individuals are still accounted as responsible for their wicked acts. Remember, for example, God used Assyria and Babylon to punish the nation of Israel. God in turn punished both Assyria and Babylon for their wicked acts against the nation of Israel. So it's important for us to understand this. God judges according to what God determines and at the appropriate time. God is with the devil and all his evil hosts separately from human beings. And the two groups should never be confused. Stop giving the devil as the reason for doing the evil acts you are doing. God does not accept it, and he will punish you for your evil acts. So it is better you stop. Understand that. When you commit sin, maybe it's fornication, maybe it's stealing, maybe it's gossiping, and you claim that the devil made you, or somebody influenced you, you're only deceiving yourself because God does not accept such excuses. God expects in every situation, in all circumstances, that he be obeyed. That he has a first option of obedience in every situation. If you look at Holy Scripture, you will find that nobody got so close to God that God did not punish when they sinned. Even David was punished. Yes. Remember Adam and Eve? It was not that God did not know the role the devil played in their sin. But God did not, because of that, say, Oh, okay, don't worry. It was not your fault. They were punished. 
And that is how God acts. When the Lord commands believers in Christ to pray for their enemies, he's referring to fellow human beings who act in opposition to them and not to the devil. God will never say you should pray for the devil. But God says you should pray for your human enemy. Again, letting you understand there is a big separation between the devil, his fallen angels, and the demons, and the wicked acts they commit, and human beings who commit wicked acts. God will judge each group as is appropriate. Never forget this. And it's repeated over and over in scripture. The Lord will punish the wicked. Yes, though the wicked may harbor the illusion that they will escape the judgment of God. There are people who laugh at sin. There are people who claim that sin is enjoyment, is pleasure. There are people who spend all their day, all their days looking for ways to enjoy themselves. And they claim and they laugh at the people of God and at God, that God will not judge anybody. Please do not harbor that illusion. Yes, no wicked person who refuses to repent will escape the judgment of God. And the people of God should not engage in wicked acts. Yes, the wicked will be judged and punished. You and I may not know the time, but we are assured upon oath by God that the wicked will by no means go unpunished. Remember again, the Lord has promised that the wicked will not escape punishment. He says, He is the one who, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that we by no means Clear the guilty. Exodus 34, 7. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and will not at all acquaint the wicked. The Lord had his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Nahum chapter 1, verse 3. So, even the wicked God used as his instrument to judge his people will still be punished, as we made reference to before, Assyria and Babylon, for example. Though the Lord has used the enemies of Israel as the instrument in the execution of his judgment upon Israel. Yes, you see the story of Assyria in 2 Kings chapter 17. Say, for example, verse 6 and also verse 23. 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 11, and 1 Chronicles 5, 6. Those enemies themselves will ultimately experience the wrath of the Lord for their evil actions, as the Lord will recover the remnant of his people from them. Isaiah 11, 11. Isaiah 14, 24 to 25. Jeremiah 50, 18. So it's important for us to recognize this truth. Though God used the foreign nations, again like we said before, Assyria and Babylon to execute judgment on his own people, yet yeah, those nations remain responsible for their action. As was with the nation, so it was with the case of individuals, which God used to judge other wicked individuals. Yes, they were responsible for their wicked acts too. Remember Jeroboam, the king of the southern uh, of the northern kingdom, who made the calf images and led uh, Israel into apostasy. God judged him, and uh, he was you know he, he was judged. God judged him by using Basha. When Basha became king of Israel, he exterminated the whole lineage of Jeroboam. 
the king of Israel. He, Basha himself, was in turn judged as he judged the house of Jeroboam. Yes, God used Zimri to judge the house of Basha. And so we can never expect the wicked to escape punishment. Again, God accepts no excuses. All this reinforces the truth that the wicked shall by no means escape punishment. Whatever reason the wicked may give to justify their wickedness will not be tenable. God will judge the wicked for their wickedness. And again, remember, God is suffering over all, without exception. All are subject to God. So the truth is that there is only one God, the living God of Israel. Again, we see that in Deuteronomy 6, verse 44, I mean, Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 to 5, and also chapter 32, verse 16. Hebrews 10, 31. He alone reigns sovereignly over all creation. The Lord has the power of life and death regarding Israel and the power to wound and to heal them. That's what we've been told. The same power he has also over the New Testament believers. God alone controls the existence of human beings and is completely at liberty to do whatsoever he wants. Again, we have looked at this before and it's affirmed in Psalm 113 verses 4 to 6, the incomparability of the Lord. Again, as repeated, it does like a repetition. This is it that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hebrews 10 31. And that God has promised to punish the wicked and commanded his people not to avenge themselves. That should settle it. You should not meddle in what is the exclusive reserve of the Lord. Yes, he says all, this, all the people of God will rejoice together. Yes, after the Lord has executed his vengeance upon the wicked, all nations will be held up, will be called upon to join Israel in the praise of the Lord, who would have provided them redemptively in Christ. Yes, he would have provided for them redemptively in Christ and also provided a new beginning in the land. The atonement for the land is the satisfaction of the wrath of God, the sacrifice of his enemies in judgment. The atonement for people is by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. Psalm 79, 9. Also quoted in Romans 15, 10 and Hebrews 1, 6. God will one day bring the light to the entire world of the Gentile. Again, that's, that's the, the, the closing part of our uh, text. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 43, where the, the nations are called to rejoice with Israel. Remember also, we are false gods in our day. They are man-made gods. They are false teachers. Yes, they are cultural practices that have taken over as God in the lives of people. All this will be judged by God. And so the question comes, remember again, how you are to re respond to the wickedness done to you. So how the Lord wants you to respond to the wickedness done to you. Because it's practical. The New Testament believer has to deal with wickedness and vengeance but not according to ordinary human instinct or inclination for revenge. So first things, first there are things 
to recognize and to accept in your response to the wickedness done to you. You need to understand that your experience is not the standard of judgment. According to your experience and everything you know, the enemy has done much harm. The wicked deserve the most severe punishment immediately. If you are to have your way, you will immediately destroy the wicked. But realize that your information is at best incomplete and heavily stilted in your favor. It is colored by your experience, by your innate desire to repay evil with evil, and your eagerness to di display your power over the will be victim of your retribution. Though you may not think you are living in faith, you know, you may think you are living in faith and obeying God perfectly. There are areas you are coming short of the righteousness of God. You are not as clean and faithful as you think you are, but God has continued to extend mercy to you. So it's important for you to recognize that you are flawed, you are flaws and you could be wrong in your assessment of who you think is wicked. You need to understand that it is God alone who can identify the wicked with certainty. It's only God who has complete knowledge. He knows all situations and all circumstances. He knows all his creation. He's the one who sets the standard. You are not the one. This is another reason you should heed the command not to avenge yourself. You could be doing wrong to the person who should not be wronged. God, who alone is completely just, is therefore the only one and who is the best place to judge and to make right all the wrongs committed. Yes, the Lord is the one truly qualified to execute vengeance. Understand and accept God has commanded and he should be obeyed. There are many references there. We've gone through almost all of them. Again, they all speak to the same thing. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. He says he will repay. Is for you, the child of God, to believe the word of God. You are told, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Romans 12, 19. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Romans 12, 21. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, says the Lord. And again, the Lord had judged his people. Hebrews 10.30 And so, the Lord has always shown mercy and compassion for those who have loved and obeyed him, even when he judges the wicked. The time of judgment of the enemies of God will also be the time of the vindication of the people of God. And so, this you need to recognize and accept. So, I won't recognize this, how you should now respond to the wickedness done to you. The golden rule for the New Testament believer is Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Matthew twenty two thirty seven, Mark twelve thirty one. Yes, it's very difficult and it's very challenging to obey, but we still must obey. Remember, our willingness to obey does not depend on how the whole thing is out according to our understanding. 
It just depends on the fact that this is what God has said. And God has a right to command. And if we claim to be people of God, then we ought to obey God. The teachings of Christ forbid personal revenge. As so, since that is so, you must prefer forgiveness, love and kindness to replace retaliation. Remember the Lord's teaching is that we should pray for our enemies. We should love them. We should do good to those who despisefully use us. This area of scripture many avoid or they try to interpret otherwise. But the truth of Holy Scripture is that the way you are to respond to the wickedness done to you is by preferring forgiveness, love and kindness to replace retaliation. You are not to put forth your hand to do evil. So we see the ethics of biblical Christianity set aside the need for personal revenge. Again, the truth is reinforced. Only God should carry out vengeance. Rather than taking the law into your own hands in disobedience, emulate the promise by calling on the Lord. O Lord God, to whom be vengeance belongeth, O God, to whom vengeance belongeth, show thyself. That's the psalmist in Psalm 94 1. So choose to obey God instead of your experience. Remember again, we are warned. Say not, I will do so to him as he had done to me. I will render to the man according to his work. Proverbs 24 29. And do not be among those who are described thus and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient whereunto also they were appointed. 1 Peter 2, 8 The wicked will be punished at the appropriate time. Never forget that. We often think God is slow and does not, save, does not see the wicked. We are tempted to take the law into our own hands. We may even think the wicked will not be punished and so become discouraged. So was the psalmist when he went, into the, until he went to the house of God. And he was granted discernment to see the end of the wicked. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou casted them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment? They are utterly consumed with terror. Psalm 73, verses 17 to 19. Again, it is crucial to remember. Yes, remember, you should not avenge yourself. Why? Because you should not avenge yourself because the Lord has reserved vengeance against the wicked for himself. The Lord will judge the wicked at his own appointed time. Your experience is not the standard of judgment. You are fallible and your judgment will be wrong. God alone can identify the wicked with certainty. Remember, God has all the information and God does not make mistakes. The believer in Christ must not avenge himself in repetition. For emphasis, the believer in Christ must not repay evil with evil, but repay evil with good. If you stretch forth to do any wrong thing, you will be doing evil. 
and you will be disobeying God. The believer in Christ must forgive, love, and be kind in place of retaliation. Remember again, that's the commandment of the Lord. The believer in Christ must appeal to God for divine intervention rather than put forth his hand to do evil. God is not saying you should pretend something wrong is not being done to you. God is not saying you should pretend you are not having pain or you are not facing difficulties or that the evil action of somebody else is not affecting you. He says you should appeal to him for the divine intervention rather than you putting forth your hand to do evil. Have all remember those things now, the things that are crucial to do. You should respond to wickedness done by you. Yes, how you should respond. You need to recognize that your experience is not the standard of judgment. One cannot repeat that enough, often enough. Recognize that God alone can identify the wicked with certainty. You need to accept that. That you are flawed in your own judgment and estimation. Recognize that only God can adequately punish the wicked. Only God knows and has the power to exhaustively and to the biggest or deepest extent punish the wicked. At worst, you will only do a little. So leave it. Leave the wicked for the one who can adequately punish the wicked. Recognize that only God can and will vindicate you. Yes, only God will make your case to be known to be right. Only God can vindicate you, not yourself. Only God can make people to see you in the right light, not yourself. Then, you go ahead by submitting to the sovereign will of God. In fact, that's the summary of everything. If you are submitting to the sovereign will of God, all that have been said before and that we follow will not be too difficult for you to do. Because you will want to do, as Jesus said, not your will, but the will of God. And when you find it difficult, you ask for grace, God gives you more grace. So, accept and obey the golden rule, that is, you must love your neighbor as yourself. You must offer forgiveness, love, and kindness to replace the retaliation. If you are honest with yourself like I am, you will agree that these things are difficult for us human beings. But they are difficult because God expects that when we see the difficulty in these things that he has commanded us to do, then we will turn to him for help. We are not to allow our hands to droop in discouragement. We are to recognize that we are not sufficient unto ourselves and then we are to turn to him so that he can exchange our weakness for his power. He can give us that enabling ability to do that which ordinarily is impossible for us. Yes, he is the present help in the time of our need. And remember that the ethics of Bible Christianity sets aside the need for personal revenge. Remember again, vengeance is mine. I will repay, said the Lord. This is how you are to respond to the wickedness done to you according to the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Thank you, my Father in heaven, for your goodness and mercy towards me. O oh Lord, grant me the strength to walk through my heart 
in faithfulness to you. And the courage of conviction to be patient and not avenge myself as I wait your judgment upon the wicked. Grant me the boldness and fortitude to, to despite myself step forward in acts of forgiveness, love, and kindness to those responsible for hurting me. That I may know out of my own experience that your ways and means are better than mine. I never put forth my hand to do evil in avenging myself. That even in the face of persecutions, hardships, and disappointments, you are there teaching me things I can otherwise, I cannot otherwise learn. That why you patiently sharpen your sword of vengeance and prepare the judgment of the wicked, I may grow more and more in grace, and my life may continue to testify to your goodness and mercy as you uphold me in Jesus' name. Amen. Please understand. All that have been said are said to believers in Christ alone. If you are not yet a believer in Christ, this does not apply to you. For you cannot be asked to obey a God you do not believe in, a God you know nothing about other than hearsay. For God is aware of your existence. You can become adopted into the family of God. Because God has made provision, but then you need to accept the assessment of God. He assessed all human beings, and he said all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23. And because he's a holy God, his judgment, his justice demands, de demands that that justice be, uh, that justice be satisfied by judging the wicked. And so he tells us the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. But then you cannot save yourself. And so he made provision for you to be saved. But hear this, even in your sinful state, God continues to show and to demonstrate his love. Let's read Romans 5, 8 and John 3, 16. But God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, God did not say we should clean up ourselves, that we should do this and then before we come to be saved. But why we remain in our sins? He made Christ, his only begotten Son, to die for our sins. Further, for God so loved the world, that is, the people in the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him do not perish but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. I hope you understand that. He has given his son. What the person needs to do is to believe in him and that person will not perish. The opposite is true. A person who does not believe in Christ will perish and not have everlasting life. So we have, it is explained further. If thou shalt I confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. I do hope you understand that. You are to confess with your mouth the, that Jesus Christ is Lord. And then you are to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and then you will be saved. And it is explained further, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth, conversion is made unto salvation. And so you believe with your heart unto righteousness, and then you confess with your mouth unto salvation. So what you believe in your heart, you speak with your mouth. Romans 10, 9 to 10. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So the invitation is to all, including you. And perhaps, till now, maybe you have been claiming you do not know things. Your ignorance ends now. You have heard now. You are now in the time of decision making. And I'm encouraging you 
not to delay any longer. Please understand these are not my words. It is the Lord Jesus Christ who is calling you. Hear him now as he calls. And as you hear, please hear the Lord's call now. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30. Please, that is the Lord calling you. I'm encouraging and I'm appealing to you here now and act on the call of the Lord. Please remember a Christless life is a crisis filled, hell heading life on a brakeless but fast moving vehicle. I'm appealing to you now. Please, you need to get out of that vehicle now before it is too late and it crashes headlong into hell. And I pray. May the Lord accept you into his kingdom as you appropriate the finished sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. In Jesus' name, amen.